sports crazed world, finding better ways to compete has become an obsession for a lot of us. Whether it's at the amateur level or all the way to the top levels of the professional ranks, all of us want to improve our abilities. And today, technology is making that easier than ever. Welcome to NASA 360. I'm Jennifer Pulley, and today we're going to see how technology that was originally devised to help pilots and astronauts can now be found in sporting equipment that can be used by all of us. Okay, so here in the States, one of the most popular sports is football. And for those of us in the stands, how fun is it to watch the game wrapped in a blanket on a brisk fall day? But of course, months before the chill is in the air, the players begin preparing for the season by practicing in the broiling heat of the summer. Unfortunately, the heat, exercise, and all those pads can lead to heat stroke. Luckily, a NASA-developed technology is now helping protect players from being overcome by heat stroke. Johnny Alonzo traveled to Philly to see how this technology works. Hey, how's it going? Okay, so if you've seen the show before, you know that NASA's done a lot more than just work on space and aeronautic problems. I mean, one of NASA's key objectives is to take what we've learned in space and apply it to everyday applications back here on Earth. Well, one technology originally developed for space is now being used to help keep athletes safe from heat stroke. Now, heat stroke may not sound that serious to some of you, but it's the third leading cause of death among athletes here in the U.S. So it's really a big problem. So how is NASA know-how helping keep athletes safe? Well, with this thing. I mean, it looks like a regular pill, but it's not. It's actually a small ingestible thermometer that can give you instantaneous core temperature readings from inside an athlete's body. Okay, so why would NASA need an ingestible thermometer? Well, just like football players, our astronauts wear a lot of equipment doing some pretty strenuous tasks. Like spacewalks, for instance. At NASA, a spacewalk is called an EVA or extravehicular activity. Before astronauts prepare for a spacewalk, they first put on a really bulky suit. And these walks are not joy rides either. They're usually very strenuous repair or installation missions that can take hours to complete. During these missions, astronauts routinely perform lifting, pulling, and tugging to get the job completed. Now, current spacesuits are basically a self-contained spaceship. I mean, they have miles of heating and cooling elements inside them to help the astronauts stay nice and comfy even when the outside temperatures can fluctuate by 500 degrees in a matter of seconds. But even with heating and cooling units, astronauts still release body heat and humidity inside the suit, which could lead to heat exhaustion and eventually heat stroke. This is where the thermometer comes in. Ground controllers back at NASA can monitor the core temperature of astronauts on the ground while astronauts are working up in space. This monitoring is just another way that NASA helps to keep its crews safe. And back here on Earth, technology is helping athletes perform at high levels by providing instantaneous data about their core temp. It was originally used by astronauts for the space shuttle, but now it's being used by amateur and professional athletes alike to keep them safe. So dig it. Traveled here to Westchester University, right near Philadelphia, to speak with a friend of mine who's leading the effort in preventing heat stroke in athletes. Hey, Sandy, how you doing? Doing good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, can you just uh, tell me a little bit about this, uh, about your core temperature device? How does they've, it work? they've got little sensors in them, like, yes. like this. Okay. And they swallow those. Right. And then I'm able to walk up behind and punch their jersey number, and I get their body temperature. Is that what you were just doing right now? That's what I just did to that player. No kidding. Yep, he's at a little, a uh, little bit over 100. A little bit over 100. Yep. And they just started practice. I know. Can you imagine what it's going to be like an hour from now? I know. <laughs> I know. We're using it actually in two ways. Um, we're using it to just track the players' core temperatures to see how hot they get. Okay. Um, from a clinical standpoint, we can use it to take the players out if they get too hot. Um, and then I've been using it for several years to do research, which has really been a kind of cutting edge research in this population. It's different from like the elderly who die in a heat wave. These players actually, when they succumb to heat stroke, it's called exertional heat stroke. Okay. And it comes from being very active in this population. They're doing physical contact drills. It's warm and humid out here. They're in sure. full equipment. Sure. So it's, it's a situation where they're um, producing more heat than they're able to get rid of. So their body temperature rises very high. Heat exhaustion occurs when the body can no longer dissipate heat adequately because of the amount of heat being produced within the body. When this happens in severe cases, the body becomes overwhelmed and begins to fail, leading to brain and organ damage, or even death. Unfortunately, in 2001, Minnesota Vikings football player Corey Springer died when his core body temperature shot at over 108 degrees. His untimely death led the NFL to start studies to figure out how they can prevent this from ever happening again. One of the NFL's test teams is the Philadelphia Eagles. So Dr. Folks Godek has been working with the Eagles for several seasons and has already helped save lives. 
All right, so I know uh, we're here at Westchester University and you're working with a lot of college dudes and everything. I have heard you work with professionals as well, correct? Yep. i um, been working for the past six seasons with the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, I started out thinking that um, rehydration using normal, you know, rehydration drinks was the best way to go. I thought that, that it was dehydration that was the primary cause of, of athletes getting hot. And through my research with these guys, I found that that's not the case. Um, so then we started looking at um, fluid balance um, and realized that these players can't stay in fluid balance, particularly the first three days of preseason, because they're not in electrolyte balance. Um, and then that leads you to, okay, how are we going to put those, put those electrolytes back? These offensive and defensive linemen sweat at an average rate of two and a half liters an hour. So some of these players are losing upwards of three liters an hour, which might be 12 liters in a day of yeah. two-a-day practices. And the other thing that, that we found is that you can't just put the water back. You've got to put significant amounts of sodium chloride or salt back as okay. well. And we're now to the point where we can actually tailor make a rehydration electrolyte program for each individual athlete. Cool. So we've really decreased the incidence of muscle cramps. We have um, made these players feel better. Um, therefore, that should, that should translate into a better performance because they really see it as, as you're watching out, out, out for them. So in preseason, when you've got 90 players on a field, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, you're not putting them in jeopardy. So that's why the core temperature monitor is, is really important. All right, Sandy, so this is Oops. 91, right? This is the guy right here? Yep. All right, you want to show me what you're doing? Yep. I'm going to put it in sports mode. Okay. Like that. That's sports mode. Players. Okay. And I'm going to push in 91. So what did you just do? 102? Check that out, really. 102.3. 102.3. What if you do a reading and uh, the player's temperature is actually too high? We actually um, go more still on symptoms. So if they, if their player, if their temperature is high and they don't feel good, they've got the symptoms that suggest oh, exertional okay. heat stroke. Not just the reading. Then, yeah, not just the reading. That's the first year I was up at Eagles camp. We actually were taking players out because we felt they were too high right. and they were actually fine. So they were okay. now it's a combination of how do they feel and then what is the temperature when you know when they're feeling bad. Actually. I see. I see. And then we take them out and the protocol is to obviously rapidly cool them down. Um, of ice water immersion is the best way to do it. Um, you can also do it pretty effectively with with ice towels and those types of things. Sure. So it's a matter of getting their core temperature down as fast as possible. One of the myths people don't understand is it's not necessarily how high an athlete's core temperature is, it's how long they stay high. So oh. even if they're at 106, 107, if they start to become symptomatic, it's a matter of rapidly cooling them. So you don't want them, you don't want to transport them from the field to the hospital you want to initiate cooling right away. It's amazing the technology that was uh, originally developed for NASA some you know, 25 years ago has such broad uh, implications in you know, not just athletes, but you know, huge uh, implications in, in professions like firefighters and keeping our military safe and those types of things as well. So it's, it's because of this technology that we've really gone way beyond what we were ever able to do in the laboratory setting. All right, who can forget the stunning success that the swimmers had in the 2008 Beijing Olympics? Now, one of the big reasons for their success was the development of a specialized Speedo swimsuit called the Laser Racer. Now, this suit was proven to reduce the swimmer's time by about 2%. While that doesn't sound like much, over 60 world records were broken by swimmers wearing this suit. Johnny Alonzo caught up with Olympic swimmer Katie Hoff in Baltimore to see how NASA wind tunnel technology helped in the suit's design. Hey, how's it going? Okay, so as Jen just mentioned, NASA researchers are using their knowledge with fluid dynamics and wind tunnels to improve Speedo's laser racer swimsuit. I right, so wait, you're probably thinking to yourself, come on, how hard can it be to design a swimsuit? Well, let me tell you, it's hard. You have to test tons of different materials and designs, develop unique welding techniques, make sure that it conforms to international swimming standards, and much, much more. So after years of work with NASA, do you think Speedo's laser racer swimsuit was a success? Well, if you dial into the 2008 Summer Olympics, then you probably know it was a huge success. Participants wearing the laser racer suits won 94% of the races that year. And check out the stats for world records broken. Over 60 of them were smashed by swimmers wearing the laser racer suit in 2008 alone. 
So this suit really made a huge difference. In a few, I'll tell you a little more about how the suit was designed. But first, let's talk to one of those athletes who broke some of those world records. I met up with three-time Olympic medalist Katie Haw at the North Baltimore Aquatic Club in our mutual hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. So you've been swimming for a long time. So when you put on the new suit, did it feel like it was going to make you any faster? Definitely. I remember the first time I uh, got to kind of test out the suit before I competed, and it was actually right over there, and I dove in the water and um, just popped up right away to stop, and I was like, you know, oh my god, this suit is amazing. So are there any obvious differences between the old suits that you used to wear compared to the new suit that you're wearing now? Definitely. There are a lot of differences. I remember the probably two suits ago, um, it was called the FS2, and um, I was only able to wear just a regular cut. I didn't cover my legs or anything else. Sure. And um, so that suit, you know, it didn't have the compression that the laser has. And even the next suit, the FS Pro, had some compression, but it, it wasn't the same in the core. And, um, I, you know, I didn't feel like I was able to kind of ride on the surface the way that I do with this suit. All right, let's take a few minutes to talk about why the suit is so successful. But first, we need to talk a little bit about something called drag. Whether you're an Olympic swimmer, an astronaut blasting into space, or even a passenger in a commercial airplane, everyone and everything has to deal with drag. Basically, viscous drag is the force of friction that slows down a moving object when it's traveling through air or water. So as you're moving forward, there's always the force that's slowing you down. The trick is to find ways to make an object move more efficiently. If you can do that, you can almost guarantee that object will use less energy. So Katie, can you uh, walk us through the suit? Yes, well, this is this is actually only a Olympic issue one because the other ones are usually just black. Okay. But um, so this is pretty cool. The sides when you did dolphin kick off the wall was was really really cool looking. Sure. Um, so this part is the main part when I was talking about the core mm -hmm. right through here really stabilizes your core so that you know it's very tight and you know right. almost like a corset. <laughs> and um, and so this part these part you want over your hips and then this. These are, you know, this really gets your legs tight and streamlined, um, as well as the back of the suit, you know, basically girls don't look like girls anymore. <laughs> you know, it, all your... it compresses everything, so <laughs> that's kind of nice. Um, Takes all your curves. Yeah, but it's definitely worth it and, you know, helps you feel streamlined and Is great. it constricting anywhere? I mean, it... it's, you know, it's really tight. It's just something that, you know, your race isn't that long. You sure. can you can handle it. Yeah. So you, you just don't like wear, you don't want to wear it for a couple hours. Probably not the best idea. So what did you think when you heard that NASA was involved in the testing? I thought um, that, you know, I thought it was great that NASA was, you know, willing to help us swim for swimsuits. You know, yeah. you think NASA, you think space and all that. So right. it kind of gave me a lot of confidence, you know, in the suit, the fact that, you know, we were going to be backed with such a great technology. Starting back in the early 1900s through today, NASA has been using its wind tunnels to test everything from rockets to aircraft to make them more efficient. With this base of knowledge, researchers at NASA, working in collaboration with Speedo, tested over 100 different swimsuit materials in wind tunnels to see how they would fare. After years of exhaustive study, one material stuck out. It was called laser pulse. This material was superior because it was not only efficient at reducing drag, but it also repelled water and was extremely lightweight, meaning it's the perfect material for a top-tier swimsuit. And check this out. Even the seams on the suit were studied. Why? Well, believe it or not, seams produce drag as well. Even if the seam only slows you down a little, in the high-stakes world of competitive swimming, that could be too much. Even a hundredth of a second can determine whether you finish first or last. So tests were performed on traditionally sewn seams and on ultrasonically welded seams to help them identify problem areas. NASA's wind tunnel results help Speedo create a bonding system that eliminates seams and reduces drag, allowing the laser racer to become the first fully bonded, full body swimsuit with ultrasonically welded seams. This process alone reduces drag by 6%. Another benefit to the swimmer is how the suit is constructed. The suit provides extra compression in key areas to help a swimmer use less energy, allowing them to swim more quickly. Translation, more metals and more records broken with the suit. Now, all this efficiency really paid off because researchers were able to reduce the skin friction drag on the previous Speedo FS Pro suit by about 24%. This reduction meant that swimmers using the new suit reduced their racing times by about 2%. With that kind of jump, man, world records began falling almost immediately and are still falling. Oh, and one more thing. Let's not forget that NASA is using its wind tunnels to make the aircraft we fly more efficient too. 
So the next time you board an airplane, just know that NASA technology has helped make that plane safer and more efficient. Hang tight, you're watching NASA 360. Almost all of us at one time or another have taken part in a competitive sport. I'm talking from Little League all the way up to the pros. There are a lot of current and former athletes out there. But even if you've never played a sport, you might have heard the term in the zone. What exactly does that mean? Basically it's when your mind and your body are working together in perfect sync and you feel almost unstoppable while playing sports. For example, if you play basketball, every time you shoot, you just know that you're going to sink the shot. Or with golf, every time you putt, you know the ball is going in the hole. Of course, getting into the zone is not very easy. Sure, in practice, you could sink that foul shot every single time, but how would you do with that foul shot if you are trying to win the big game? You have 30,000 fans screaming at you and one second left on the clock. Not so easy, huh? That's why top pros and Olympic athletes spend countless hours training their bodies and minds to perform perfectly at crunch time. They try to build a bridge between the mind and the muscles to perform in sync together. So what can you do to help your chances of performing at crunch time? Practice, of course. But how do you replicate the feeling and stress that comes along with performing at crunch time? Well, would you believe NASA can help with that? My friends Dr. Pope and Dr. Prinzel have developed a cutting-edge technology called The Zone that uses biofeedback to help athletes train their mind and muscles for athletics. To show you how this works, we came to the Kings Mill Golf Course here in Williamsburg, Virginia, where we will be testing this device with LPGA golfer Katherine Hall. While Dr. Pope is hooking Catherine up to the machine, let me tell you a little bit about the device. It's called the Zone, which stands for Zeroing Out Negative Effects. Basically, it uses biofeedback to help train a person to put their mind and muscles in sync while performing a specific task, like putting, for instance. Now, originally, NASA used this type of biofeedback training to help pilots stay alert throughout long trips, but it was found to work in many other ways, including sports. The device works like this. An off-the-shelf golf putting practice system was modified to monitor either physiological conditions or brainwave functions within the subject. If the subject is too tense or has the wrong brainwave activity, several visual and auditory cues will give them feedback, which forces them to alter their present state. For example, if the subject is not at optimal levels, the putting surface will undulate, the hole size will decrease, and the mounting laser will swing wildly. But once the subject's muscles or brain waves are at optimal levels, the trainer will relax, allowing the subject to putt. The objective for trainees is a perfect putt every time, even under the most stressful conditions. It's awesome. Like, it, make, it makes you think about relaxing your body, and not just in your face, but the, re like, the rest of you. Professionals, just like everyone else, get nervous and um, excited, especially you know, in, a, in a stressful uh, moment, such as you know, making a putt to win the tournament the ability to be able to relax and uh, focus and concentrate, but mostly clear your mind, not have all those swing thoughts, not overthink the putt is uh, very important. Tell us why NASA or how NASA got involved with, with golf and biofeedback. This research uh, started out, we were looking at trying to improve the attention and uh, cognitive state just for pilots and air traffic controllers, trying to help them do their job better. And what we discovered is some of the same responses we were getting with pilots while they were on the flight deck or controllers while they were managing air traffic was some of the same things that we saw from other research that was uh, for golfers, for example. So we thought, well, we could apply some of this technology to uh, helping pilots because pilots and air traffic controllers really like golf. They like to do it in their recreation time. And this was a way that we can employ these techniques in a fun way one that would make it very rewarding and keep them motivated, keep them wanting to keep doing this. And we've been highly successful with that. So we thought, well, let's just extend this and let's see if um, regular golfers uh, would be interested in this technology as well. Catherine, how has the zone helped you just in this time that you've been here? Well, it's instant feedback on how relaxed your body is. And 
basically from head to toe. And when I when I'm over here and the laser's yeah. moving, um, as soon as I can calm everything down internally, then the laser stops and I'm able to, to part at my best. Now, do you get that feeling of stress inside? At, at, maybe not here, but during a tournament? What do you do? Well, when you're under pressure out on the golf course, yeah. everything gets heightened. Your, your heart beats faster and you get more adrenaline. And, and I think that the key for us out there is to control everything using our breathing, but this gives me another kind of physiological response and um, something else to think about that I can kind of tone down if I do get in a pressure situation. Yeah, well, and you've really kind of controlled this machine. It's amazing to watch it. Yeah, it, it only took a few, but uh, I mean, it's great feedback, and I think, yeah, I'll probably be thinking about it now from more on. Right, right, right. Can you do another one for us? I'll try, yeah. So you, I heard you talk before about you were, when you're getting ready to putt, you kind of relaxed, but then you continue to stay relaxed based on this, this feedback. Yeah, it's what it's telling me right now. And um, it's just, a, I think it's a calmness that you've got to learn to control and you can control it as evidenced by this. So the faster that you can do it and the longer that you can maintain it, the better. So is, is putting the only application for this type of biofeedback? Putting was just the first application that we chose because uh, a lot of the uh, pilots and controllers uh, reported that they enjoyed playing golf. And so this was one way we thought we could embed, you know, in a fun way that we know that they would uh, keep at it and keep uh, practicing the, uh, the skills that we had taught them while they were um, at our center. What we have found though is that uh, since you know, NASA is involved with quality of life and, um, and, and what we've learned is that we can employ this type of technology in essentially any type of activity that people find enjoyable. There you have it. As you can see, NASA technology isn't just being used in space. All of us can benefit from it in one way or another. That's it for now. For Johnny Alonzo, I'm Jennifer Pulley. Catch you next time on NASA 360. Welcome to NASA 360. I'm Jennifer Pulley, and today we're going to see how technology that was originally designed. <laughs> now, with that kind of jump, man, world records began dropping and continue to fall. That's not the line. <laughs> so, the next time you board an airplane, just know that NASA technology has helped. Has helped it make it safer and more efficient. You had 30,000 screaming fans screaming at you. That's twice. And see, I'll tell you how. In a few, I'll tell you a little bit more. I'll tell you a little about, I'll tell you a little about how the suit. In a few, I'll tell you a little about how the suit. Here. <laughs>